Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The InterAg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you. Access knowledge about the latest policy trends. Discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe. Find solutions in our peer review. Get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this insightful and engaging webinar on artificial intelligence for local authorities. Together, today we gather virtually from various corners of Europe and uh, united by a, a shared commitment of exploring the immense potential of AI in transforming our local communities for the better. As you may know, uh, artificial intelligence has a great potential uh, for local authorities and, and has rapidly evolved. And to get, today, we gather different experts, policymakers, and practitioners that will share their uh, knowledge, their experience on how to harness artificial intelligence in the right way to have good impact on local communities. But First and foremost, uh, let me introduce our team for today. So I am Laura Varisco. I am one of the thematic experts of the policy learning platform. And today, Mark and Lottie are with me. So maybe Mark and Lottie, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, well, good afternoon from me. Uh, thanks, Laura, for the invite to join this uh, interesting webinar. Uh, I think we're all going to learn an awful lot. And I think I'm probably the first one to. Uh, be looking forward to listening to the presentation. So uh, I'll join you later. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hi, everyone. I'm the web and community expert for the policy learning platform, and I'll be uh, supporting this webinar from the technical point of view. So should you have any issues, don't hesitate to contact us in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for co-moderating this webinar with me. But also, Please join me in giving a warm and enthusiastic welcome to our notable speakers. So we have Guido Ring from the Netherlands, Vice Mayor of the Municipality of Emmen and member of the European Committee of the Regions. Hello, Guido. Uh, good Can afternoon, everyone. Work? Hello, good afternoon. And then we have uh, Margaret Queen from Ireland, from uh, Airnet, the European uh, Network uh for the application of communications technology hello margaret thank you laura glad to be here thank you thank you uh, and we also have last but not least christina Koch joining us from austria from the austria business service hello christina hi there hi hi thank you thank you speakers for joining us today and for sharing your expert expertise. Uh, so just ha let's have a look at uh, the timeline for today. So we will have uh, different presentations and they, they will be alternated with uh, question answers moderated sessions. And we will close up with a, a plenary moderated panel discussion. So please, the objective of our webinar, that they, they, they must be interactive. So as Lottie said, uh, do not hesitate to use the chat or the question and answers box to uh, uh, raise, raise uh, your questions. And before we dive into the heart of our discussion, I would like to start with uh, a nice breaker poll. 
So we are using a Slido. Um, so please, I think that you will see it on screen. Perfect. Thank you, Lottie. So uh, I'm I'm sure that you know how to use the Slido. So you just just um, click on uh, on um, on the QR code to, and to connect to the page. And the, the question we would like to ask you to start this, uh, this webinar is, if you had to describe artificial intelligence in just three words, what would they be? Please submit them separately. Okay, great. I see that the answers are coming. This will create a nice word cloud. Thank you. So I'm reading them out loud, smart, game changer, Revolutionary, trailblazer, scary, wow. <laughs> we will discuss it later. Mind blowing, again, scary. Frightening, okay. Automatic, amazing, trustworthy. Wow, thank you. Thank you for your, uh, your answers. Structure, decision-making, controversial. Well, I, th I think we have a nice insight also for you speakers. You can you can have uh, inspirations from uh, from all, all these uh, word cloud, data, possibilities, knowledge, eye opening. Again, risky. Okay, maybe some seconds left for you. Thank you very much for your participation. I see you are quite active. <laughs> Thank you. Liberating. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think we can continue. Um, let me go back to my presentation. So I will be quick. I would just wanted to present uh, the reason why you are here. What is the policy learning platform uh, within the Interreg Europe uh, program? So as you may know, the Interreg Europe program main objective is to promote regional development and, uh, and cohesion within the European Union by fostering cooperation and exchange of experiences among regional and uh, local authorities. So just in a simple word, Interreg Europe helps policymakers to find new solutions to the challenges they are facing in their region. How do we do that? Uh, the Interreg Europe program has two main strengths. The first one deals with project funding. So the, the, the Interreg Europe funds um, uh, co collaborative uh, projects. And the second strength, it's the policy learning platform. So as I said, I'm one of the thematic experts of the, the policy learning uh, platform. And this platform is the tool of the Interreg Europe program uh, that facilitates the, this uh, exchange of knowledge, uh, experiences, and best practices among uh, policymakers and the practitioners around Europe. And how do we do it? Uh, through different services we can offer. Um, uh, and they, are, they can be categorized into um, access to knowledge. So on our website, we have a repository of uh, thousands of good practices from, uh, from, uh, from regional uh, experiences around Europe that can inspire others. And we also provide expert knowledge through policy briefs that you can that are accessible through uh, our websites. Then we have services that are under the access to people category. And we can have webinars like this one, but also larger scale events on site that we host throughout the year. And last but not least, we also provide expert support. So uh, we are a group of thematic experts from different uh, uh, policy, policy background. And you can have access to us through our uh, policy help desk that you can access on our website. And also, uh, the expert support can be provided by you because we have one service that is called uh, peer review, which facilitates peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, across practitioners and policymakers. 
and it is uh, one of our top service. And uh, uh, the peer review is a two-day collaborative process in which experts from various European regions assess and provide feedback on a specific policy challenge from a host region. You can see uh, we started this service in 2019 and uh, on the map we can see that almost all countries are pinned. So this demonstrates the success and the, the interest of, of, of this service. And of course, if you are interested in knowing more or if you want to apply, to be host or peer uh, of, of, of our peer review service, you can find more information on our website. And here I just wanted to give you some concrete examples of our, of our services, and I kindly invite you to have a look of our, on our Interreg Europe webpage. And uh, it's, all, it's all from my side, so I'm leaving the floor to my colleague Mark that will uh, dive more in, in depth in our today's session. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, as we said in the introduction, um, Laura and I are both thematic experts from the policy learning platform. And our job is to say capitalize on the knowledge that comes from the projects, but also help you identify trends, uh, whether they're mega, micro trends that may be not yet featuring the project portfolio, but that might be relevant and that can help you prepare the next uh, uh, project that you might want to submit, but it also can help you deliver uh, other policy objectives that you might be uh, uh, faced with in your regional city, national uh, context. So that's where the sort of AI uh, you know, idea stemmed from and clearly, with the Interreg Europe community, we're particularly interested in seeing how the uh, AI uh, uh, agenda will affect your uh, ability to deliver and design services. And so the speakers will tell you more about it and in more detail than I will here. But I think we saw from the, the word cloud how there are words that are very positive and there are words that are also more challenging, you know, scary is, is one. Uh, the, the dangers, the, uh, the risks, the, the cyber uh, dimensions. And so part of your policy maker agenda needs to take into account these different dimensions. But in terms of looking at the, um, the positive elements, we see the, the ability of uh, local authorities to take a leadership role, because I think uh, clearly is a, a gap, there's an opportunity uh, for looking at how AI can be used constructively and effectively for designing and enhancing your policy uh, portfolio. Um, you know, in particular, we, we've seen the way in which large data sets can be analyzed, trends, of, whether it's demographic or behavioral trends can be better analyzed and therefore determine uh, the context for better policy making. Uh, the ability to design uh, already new services, and we've seen that in particular in traffic and the modelization, uh, climate mitigation, climate adaptation, uh, public safety. Uh, so things that are very much at the heart of European citizens' uh, needs. And I think one of the challenges is to show how AI can be a benefit rather than this, you know, taking control, uh, uh, something that we won't be feeling as comfortable with. And there are also techniques in which your ability to, let's say, deliver some of your policies and, and procurement can be one way, uh, which can be looking at uh, enhancing your operational processes. But as I said, already said, that demonstrating how these uh, advantages are relevant for the citizens uh, would seem to be one of the interesting paths to actually explore. Uh, next slide and my last slide, you'll be glad to hear. But, uh, I'm click on Laura. The risks, we know, we, we've seen it in terms of uh, elections, we've seen it in terms of social media, we see it in the way in the way the algorithms that lie behind the different AI tools that are being developed. Um, every day there's a new service. Uh, Laura and I are both based in, in the uh, south of France. And uh, just this week, we had three invitations to local meetings, uh, AI summit, uh, local authorities and AI. Uh, etc. on how this can be relevant to policymakers. So it's, I think it's an important uh, uh, and let's say 
not to be ignored. Uh, you can't just bury your head in the sand and say, well, we'll, we'll see what others develop. Uh, and with this in mind, we've seen how the European Commission is taking uh, you know, quite an important leadership role. And we'll hear that from, from Guido Rink in some of his uh, uh, slides. But already we're seeing the ethical uh, elements, the guidelines for trustworthy uh, AI. And trust is a word that appeared in that word cloud. The regulatory framework, the, uh, the GDPR rules that have been with us for a number of years now on protecting data and uh, people's trust in data and the uh, emerging European AI strategy. So there's a lot happening and already we have 99 people listening to us today. So I'm gonna stop talking because you're more interested in hearing what our next speaker will tell us. So um, if we can uh, uh, switch uh, now to the presentations and we're very honored to have uh, Guido Rink with us. He's a member uh, in particular elected of his city in uh, Emmen in, in Netherlands, but in particular he's been working closely with the Committee of Regions on looking at how AI can be, uh, let's say, dealt with in a positive way. Guido, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organization of the Policy Learning Platform for inviting me as a speaker uh, on the very relevant, exciting, but also controversial uh, topic of AI and how we should approach this topic from a uh, European to local point of view. Uh, my name is uh, Guido Rink, uh, let's connect, uh, and I feel honored to represent the European Com Committee of the Regions during this webinar about the impact on, uh, uh, of AI on our society. I've wrote uh, two reports on the white paper and on the AI Act, and uh, it was an ecosystem of excellence and an ecosystem of trust, and we noticed that in the word salad uh, before. Um, so, as we all know, AI has uh, made its big entrance into our cities and our lives. And you've all heard of ChatGPT, of course. Most of you will probably have used it for the fun. Uh, and some might have even used it uh, to write an email or an advisory report. I didn't. But uh, AI is becoming a part of our uh, everyday lives. And we are just now starting to comprehend its impact on our society and how we as policymakers should approach AI in that matter. For example, in June 2017, Jeannie Ramati, the former CEO of IBM, stated that it will not be a world of man versus machine, it will be a world of man plus machine. Framing how AI could help and support us instead of replace us, of course. Uh, last April of this year, uh, Arvind Krishna, the current CEO of, uh, of IBM, announced that IBM pauses recruitment for jobs that AI can fill, showing us that the potential of what AI can do is now coming into effect and starting to affect our society. As you might have noticed in my brief con introduction, I queued AI as being relevant, exciting, but also controversial. Controversial because AI has both potential and possible pitfalls in which we will, might fall if we don't recognize and tackle them beforehand. I'm not making this statement to devalue AI, of course not. Its potential is huge, but the approach and the impact of AI has and will have on our society is also big. And we have to know that that's, uh, and we approach that in a holistic and realistic way. We should always want to send to people rather than machines when making decisions. This is the core value of what we call human driven AI. So, how does this human-driven approach translate into our governance and our societies? As policymakers, this view helped us to create the necessary guidelines and boundaries for AI. Hence the creation of the AI Act, which is predicted to come into place uh, next January. Um, the AI Act uh, will make sure that AI systems used in the European Union are safe, transparent, traceable, non-discriminatory and environmentally friendly. AI systems should be overseen by people rather than by uh, automation to prevent harmful outcomes. Adding to that, the I in AI stands for intelligence. Intelligence can only be achieved by the combination of knowledge and consideration of that knowledge. This being something that a computer by this day is unable to do. An algorithm will not doubt. It will always give you the most logical answer. It will give us an O or a 1. 
we absolutely need our human judgment to make intelligent decisions. A big challenge that local authorities face when it comes to human-driven uh, artificial intelligence is to actively choose to put human first. And this may seem like an open door, but when it comes to algorithms, for example, this includes understanding its inner workings to be completely transparent about why a certain choice has been made. We can't forget that algorithms are always biased. Why? Because they are trained on data that has been created by us, humans. So, at the local level, we should create guidelines for a municipal uh, organization on how to be ethically responsible about using AI systems. This way, we ethically frame how we use the system beforehand, making sure we don't lose the human in the process. So we have high-risk uh, uh, applications, low-risk applications, and no-risk uh, applications. An example of how we put this in practice in the Netherlands is by applying the IAMA, the Impact Assessment for Human Rights, when working with algorithms, created by the researchers from the University of Utrecht which is a step-by-step -step guide to create responsible artificial intelligence. So, how can we further address and cultivate the idea of human-driven AI? I believe that multi-level collaboration is key in realizing a fair playground for AI-based systems. By multi-level collaboration, I mean collaborating between European, national and local levels. By approaching human-driven AI in such a way we create connectivity between all those layers of policy making and it enables us to share our collective knowledge. It opens doors to opportunities within this diverse and broad network and we can create stages to showcase and share what we learn about the transitions that we face as a society. So we can talk about the ecosystem of excellence, the opportunities, but we also can talk about the ecosystem of trust. Where should we be more trustworthy? And, not, not, uh, and last but not least, by collaborating within a network like Interreg, funding can also be made available in order to realize this together. To conclude this keynote, my closing message to everyone watching and listening would be to keep, always keep a healthy amount of doubt, ready when dealing with AI-based systems. We should reap the benefits of AI, but also allow ourselves to remain human. Thank you. Well, I can uh, thank you, Guido, on behalf of the, uh, the people who are listening to you. I um, can also guarantee that I'm not an AI-generated avatar. It's, it's really me here. Uh, so I, I think you uh, hopefully don't doubt that these questions are coming off the top of my head and not chatbot uh, prepared. Um, you made some very useful points, and, and, I, and, I, and I'd just like to pick on, on, on two elements. One, the, the, the ability for local authorities to, um, to create these policies. Uh, I guess you need to have the, the skilled expertise in-house. Uh, and I was just wondering to what extent at your local authority level or at the you know, provincial, to what extent has the recruitment or the team structuring uh, uh, enabled you to, um, to accelerate uh, the design of uh, relevant AI policies? A simple question, but it's a difficult answer because mm. uh, I'm uh, busy with this topic for about uh, three years now uh, mm -hmm. in the Committee of the Regions. Therefore, mm. I was interested and in also working on it, but not realizing what is all uh, uh, going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, eventually, uh, since the 1st of October, I have a policy advisor at this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we are working on a policy that will help our uh, citizens, but also our uh, policy advisors uh, mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. yeah, create a good organization. But that, uh, I think, uh, exactly explains your question, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, there isn't that much uh, expertise available for local authorities, because uh, expertise is... Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's not that well, uh, it is well uh, quality, but quantity is not enough because mm. uh, they are all uh, experts and experts are expensive and local authorities uh, don't, uh, are, aren't that uh, ambitious enough uh, mm. to create uh, room for them. Mm. So that's yeah. really a difficult question. Yeah, yeah I, I guess it, would, it highlights the need for cooperation uh, because you can share those resources. 
Um, and just my last question before we move to the next speaker. In terms of the work at the Committee of Regions, uh, you've got different regional and national perspectives. Uh, are there clearly some uh, country slash regions that you would regard as being leading the way and others are are, are lagging and uh, do, do you see the sort of the cultural differences in, in the work of the Committee of Regions? Yeah, and the biggest difference is uh, in the definition of AI. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a uh, discussion about uh, the reports I made and uh, most of the time it uh, went, uh, it, it was about uh, what is the definition of AI because it's when you have a definition it's already outdated because we're uh, into new uh, um, yeah, possibilities with AI. So, um, but if you uh, look at Europe, I think Scandinavian and, and uh, Baltic states are uh, really uh, far, uh, and, yeah, really good. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, there were uh, the university, there's a lack of universities or uh, uh, connectivity, there's a, a lack of uh, expertise. So that's mm -hmm. uh, so it's f quite diverse, uh, but I think uh, uh, the front runners are uh, Scandinavian and uh, the Baltic states. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, I see some of you are putting questions in the Q&R, so keep doing that, and uh, Guido will join us at the end in a, where all the three speakers. So um, I think a virtual clap for your, your, your keynote uh, insights. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up with you a bit later. So See you later. Thank you. Margaret Quinn. Hello, Mark. You're next, and uh, it's great to have you uh, with us. You're a uh, uh, a loyal supporter of the Interreg Europe community, and uh, uh, you always find some good ideas to put into the projects. And I, I can't fail to notice the two little letters in the middle of your latest acronym, Enabler. Uh, so we have an artificial intelligence uh, at the heart of your project, um, but you're going to tell us more about that. So uh, the floor is yours, Margaret. Thank you. And um, the enabler is down to a, an excellent team in Earnact and our partners that are involved in this project. So I'll share my screen and hopefully find the right place. So you can see my screen now. Yes, you can just... Uh those black boxes away. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Margaret, can you put it on presentation mode? Yeah. Okay. There you go, is that okay? Still have some black boxes. I don't know if you arranged to remove them. One is gone. So, <laughs> is the black box still there? Yeah, we can still see it, Margaret. Maybe I can share the presentation for you. Okay, go ahead. Let me know when you want to move to the next slide. Just a second. I think you can see it now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm here to tell everybody about Enabler, uh, which is focused on using AI for public services. So as mentioned, I'm a program manager with Earnact based in the northwest of Ireland. Next slide, please. So Enabler has uh, just got underway. We're about eight months into the project. And the, our objective is to lead AI-driven policies so that uh, we can use AI to improve uh, policy in our regions and uh, employ it for digital transformation, basically for, for societal good. Next slide, please. So we bring together uh, eight partners from five regions across Europe. I hope many of them are present today. In Ireland, we have Ernat and our local county council of Donegal. Uh, we have two partners from France, Nievre-Numerique and Burgundy uh, Regional Council. 
From Spain, we have Comentos of San Sebastián. We have uh, a Polsky Center for Economic Development in Poland. And we have two Swedish partners, uh, Szoletia Municipality, and also the academic partner, the University of Umea. So we, we agree that the public sector can have a, a vital role in empowering regional use of AI and improving public services. So what we wanted to do in the project is to help build the public sector's capacity to lead that and take advantage of AI in our regions. So uh, we're running from March 2023 and we'll be winding down at the end of uh, beginning of February 2027. So next slide, please. Now, I hope this will work. In a world where technology is rapidly transforming our lives, the future of our regions and cities depends on digital transformation. Artificial intelligence possesses the potential to revolutionize public policies and services, liberating valuable time for public servants and enabling them to concentrate on high-value tasks. Introducing Enabler, an Interreg Europe-funded project that aims to empower regional and local public sector organizations to embrace the power of AI. With a well-balanced partnership spanning across five EU regions, Enabler is driving digital transformation at the grassroots level. Together, eight partners collaborate to catalyze regional digital transformation. We strategically employ AI solutions, building the capacity of the public sector to obtain the benefits of artificial intelligence responsibly and ethically. Imagine governments using AI to design smarter policies and make better decisions, enhancing communication and engagement with citizens, and fostering the growth of digital and sustainable businesses. The potential is immense, but the challenges are real. Enabler understands these challenges and is committed to bridging the gap between the public and private sectors in AI adoption. Enhanced policy instruments will pave the way for AI-driven services and policies that bring advantages to citizens, companies, research organizations, and the public sector itself. Join Enabler and unlock the transformative power of AI in your region. Enabler, empowering regional and local public sector organizations to embrace AI and transform their territories. Okay, next slide, please. In a word. Oops. Thank you. So that's a nice promo for our project. And uh, I hope it got the message across about what we're trying to do, that it's about uh, get, grasping the benefits of AI in an ethical and fair way uh, to uh, allow for better public services. Um, in an, the end result we hope to achieve will be that the public sector is also promoting AI-driven services and acting as a catalyst. So we will have five policy instruments from our five regions, hopefully adapted and improved to uh, be able to uh, support this, um, our objectives of having AI um, used in an ethical and uh, a, a way that's very positive for our regions. So, Next slide, please. AI is a massive topic, and there's a massive amount of ways that it can be used in the public sector, um, from natural language, um, the, the area of chatbots, knowledge management, communication and, and engagement with a citizen, to things like computer vision, where AI can understand images and it can be used for land cl classification, or in various health uh, kind of applications. As mentioned by Mark, predictive analytics can be um, a good way for uh, AI to be used in government-related applications. Decision support, again, where we can bring together data from different um, areas and discover socioeconomic patterns. So there's a vast array of um, areas also for climate, for flood prediction, the environment. But next slide, please. The challenges we face are, 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 are not uh, small because we are up against already a low awareness and understanding of AI within our public organizations, local authorities. 
we're in a, a period of a dizzying change with the development of AI and a lot of hype um, about what it's going to do in the future, misconceptions, are both or positive, very overly stated positive ones. This concerns on ethics and trust. We currently have very patchy adoption in public services and have to face barriers, soft ones like culture and the lack of skills perhaps, and then the harder ones of data access and infrastructure. So in, it, as I said, it's hard to keep up with AI with the exponential growth of um, chat GPT and generative AI, but we're going. that's what we're trying to do within this project to build our capacity to understand how it can be used. So the next slide, please. So what we're doing in Enabler is we've agreed a, a way of analyzing the strengths we have in each of our regions in terms of legal frameworks, regional and national strategies, the supports that we can avail of to uh, help uh, develop AI for ourselves and understand the landscape in our regions of companies that can work in partnership uh, because they have AI capability. We've had study visits to each, where we're, we're, we're in the process for having study visits to each of our partners. And we've had two to Sweden and France. So we're exchanging uh, knowledge between ourselves and learning from uh, what's available in each of the regions. A really important part of this is development of our regional stakeholder groups, which involve our local universities, um, the local authorities, and also uh, academic partners. We are building our own capacity through workshops that are shaped by Umia University on these various topics. And we're also trying to develop our own knowledge resource, which we are sharing between partners. Next slide, please. So this is just a flavor of the kind of topics that we've been covering in our discussions. And you see the ethics appears a lot, uh, what AI can and can't do, um, the role of the university in all of this in showing what kind of studies are underway, uh, how we can assess AI, what's explainable AI. Um, so it's uh, a, a lot of um, very, very valuable exchanges that we're having. Next slide. Thank you. And here's just a few examples of the kind of use cases that we are discovering amongst ourselves from things like um, an augmented caregiver in chalon sur in France, uh, a guide for the visually impaired in Sweden, uh, a recycling chatbot being used in Northern Ireland, um, how AI is supporting um, identification of water leaks and illegal pools in France, or supporting fire emergency planning, and in Poland, case assignment to make government more efficient. So there's a vast array of uh, very positive and non-controversial AI use cases, and we're learning from, our, from one another with those. Next slide, please. So a little uh, more detail. Um, the hospital food monitor uses, um, it's in Dijon in France, where patients' consumption of food can be uh, monitored through um, digital photography uh, from a smartphone and an AI solution. Pothole identification is another very useful one. And again, non-controversial, where this is being used in Nevers in France, and it's making uh, roads maintenance much, much more streamlined and efficient there. And there's a picture from the Guide for the Visually Impaired being used in uh, the Sara Kultur House in Sweden. And we also saw a human digital assistant which is very impressive just recently on our study visit to France, Nevers. And there is also the chatbot for recycling, 24 seven support for people who want to know what they can recycle, what they can't recycle, uh, which is again, a green and environmentally friendly kind of uh, AI usage. Next slide, please. So, so far, eight months, we are working hard to develop our own regional innovation ecosystems around AI. And I think that's really important because we do have, um, we're at the beginning of a journey and we need to, to build around what the, the strengths that we have in our regions from our academic partners and businesses. 
that are using AI and developing AI. It's clear we have to increase awareness and understanding of AI's potential within our organizations. Um, I think we haven't got pilots within Enabler, but I think they're very, very important to uh, really cement that knowledge of how to implement AI. And uh, our partners are finding out that there are some good um, potential for developing pilots um, with, within their regions. So we, we're getting towards a foundation for policy improvement in our five regions. But I must emphasize we are at the start of, of a long journey and it's all work in progress. So uh, next slide. Oh, okay, there you go. I think I kept to my time window. Oh, so uh, perfect. We didn't need thank to you very much. Margaret. Thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, um, you've highlighted a, a number of important messages. Um, but first, I'll, I'll, I'll give the um, question from the floor uh, from Stephanie Tusa. She says, do you have cities as partners? You showed that slide quite quickly. Uh, but are you uh, um, already having... Well, we have uh, cities. We have Sheleftia um, municipality in the mm -hmm. north of Sweden. So it would definitely count as a city. And in France, we have Nevers, mm -hmm. represented by uh, Nievre Numerique. Mm -hmm. um, so so we, we, we have partners that are, I guess, they're part of their region, but not mm -hmm. specifically. The rest are either local government mm -hmm. agencies, or I also mentioned Umea University mm -hmm. as an economic, mm -hmm. um, as mm -hmm. a, an academic partner. But, and yeah. here in Ireland, we don't have a city. We have the county council, Donegal, a, a rural county council. Mm -hmm. So a mixture, I would yeah. say, of yeah. city is, and region. Which isn't a bad thing, because you say you get different perspectives no. from things. Oh, and I, I saw a chat there. I, apologies, I forgot San Sebastian. <laughs> yeah. Apologies no, I mean, for mentor San Sebastian. But I think you also highlighted uh, the, the, the obvious fact that some of us think AI is the future, but you've just given us a quick demonstration of how AI is with us now. Uh, in it's some everywhere. Sense, you, know, we, uh, the, you know, the pothole detection, the support mm -hmm. in the health sector. Um, so it's a very much, uh, you know, you've got to keep going at a pace just to, um, to make sure you are using the latest and non-controversial. And I think that's one of the highlights of the, the Interreg Europe project you, you showcased is this learning through visiting learning uh, we know it lies at the heart of your capacity to convince um, money to be directed to particular policies by seeing it taking place in, in other similar locations and I think you've highlighted that and I think a lot of people would be interested in following your activities um, and we know that you, interact, you know you are encouraged to do the dissemination workshops um, but my one question to you if before we move on to the next speaker is in your triple helix um you know fact finding best practice missions what role um is the private sector playing because they often the ones providing uh, the technologies they you know they're taking the data that comes from a satellite and turning it into a flood detection service uh, to what extent is the private sector being engaged in your sort of triple helix uh, process i think in regional stakeholder groups they are engaged and I think that it's a different picture from our different partners. So perhaps in, uh, say in France, in Nevers, they do have some leading French AI companies. Mm -hmm. So that is a real help. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think uh, for us at the moment, that's a part of our uh, challenge is to identify local mm -hmm. AI mm -hmm. companies that can support mm -hmm. our own um, piloting. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we're relying at the moment on our, the expertise in our two local universities of Atlantic Technological University. And we're also collaborating very strongly with Nikki Ulster University, who have a very um, world-class AI group. So um, it's a very valid point. And uh, I think developing those regional AI innovation ecosystems is a key way to being able to overcome the kind of limitations we have as public um, organizations with limited finance. Mm -hmm. mm, indeed, 
Mm. And the other one, I think you mentioned it as well, is the importance of um, collaboration. Guido mentioned it as well. Mm. Collaboration between local authorities within our, um, our, our northwest of Ireland. Mm. And again, within this project, it helps overcome those barriers that we face mm. of, um, yeah, in, AI implementation, mm -hmm. it's um, it's better mm -hmm. if it's shared collaboration to mm -hmm. help lower those barriers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one question you can answer perhaps in our last uh, session is uh, from Marina Manzoni, who says, uh, could you give us a bit more information about the five instruments? So we've got a few minutes to revise on that question, Margaret. And uh, thank you very much for this uh, insight into Enabler. Okay. And now from Northwest Ireland, we're going to move to uh, Austria. Uh, and uh, I think hopefully our, uh, Christina is uh, somewhere on, on screen. Yes, Christina Koch, welcome. Yep. Um, you can share your, your slides and put it in full presentation mode. That would be perfect. Yeah. So do you see it in full presentation mode? We do. <laughs> Great. So thank you also from my side the, for the invitation to speak uh, today. Um, my organization is called Austria Wirtschaftsservice, which is Austria's national promotional bank. So we have the money, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we have the money for companies in Austria to support them in any kind of area that is innovative or relevant. When it comes to artificial intelligence, we did not have a funding program um, until recently. Uh, in 2020, we have... Um, applied for a peer review that was mentioned before already uh, for an Interreg Europe peer review on the topic of artificial intelligence because we did not have the expertise in our house and we wanted to learn from different regions um, on like how could such a program supporting SMEs in developing artificial intelligence in a trustworthy way? How could that look like? What would be um, good things to include? How could we support them? So within those two days, we, we have worked together with um, several peers um, and, and experts on this field from Europe and also people from, the, from Interreg Europe. Uh, from the program and the policy learning platform <clears throat> and have worked uh, on several, like 23 recommendations on how to do all that. Um, what happened after that is that we had a, a pilot program, first a small one to support uh, companies in doing that, in yeah, implementing artificial intelligence in a trustworthy way. And we could see that there's a lot of interest. And generally, of course, we all know artificial intelligence is becoming bigger and bigger and uh, many more companies will use it in the future. So uh, we have now extended our program supporting companies in that area. Right now we have three different ones um, in different sizes. So we have one, one um, funding program supporting, which is called AI Start, supporting SMEs with a smaller budget, like 15,000 euro as a grant for to implement um, Trustworthy AI, but for the first steps to do that. Um, we also have a bigger one, AI adoption, with up to 150,000 euro um, to um, also maybe do some preparations for AI regulations, standards, and certifications. And um, additionally, we also have a, a knowledge program, AI knowledge, where you can, uh, where we finance um, consulting with experts on that field um, for AI to develop AI data strategies. Um, or business and innovation protection strategies for your own company. We see that there is a lot of gap in companies or a big need in companies that they would should invest in that area. And um, Austria tries to support companies to invest uh, in this area because we can see that this is very important. Um, also, as, as it was mentioned in the beginning in the first um, um, with the first question, artificial can intelligence can be scary and risky and also risky for companies and we want to avoid that. So that's why we want to support them and help them uh, invest in this area so that they can use artificial intelligence in a good and trustworthy and a safe way. What, so actually it went from uh, 
from us, for us, it went from peer review to a pilot program to now currently three AI programs. The next step that we're planning to do, what at least we have applied for it, is a, a possible new Interreg Europe project um, where we applied for as a lead partner, um, which is called Embrace Me. Um, to improve the conditions and policies for SMEs um, to embrace artificial intelligence. Um, it is uh, still under evaluation and by the Trans Secretary, so the final decision will come by mid of December. We hope for the best, of course. Um, in this project, we would plan to, um, it will be different than, <laughs> than, um, than uh, the Enabler project, of course. Uh, we have a much more, we would have a um, more focus on SMEs. Uh, and supporting SMEs um, in different areas, like raise awareness of art artificial intelligence, um, to um, support them in invest in human capitals and skills, facilitate access to finance, um, networking and cooperation, and also strengthen the governance of AI and SMEs policies. Also, we would like to do um, some sort of co-creation workshops um, in which we want to exchange with different regions on how to best implement the AI, the EA, the e, <coughs> sorry, the AI Act <laughs> in um, in each country because you know that every country has some sort of freedom in how to implement it, and uh, by exchanging, um, we might um, we will. Uh, this, I think that will make a lot of sense because we're all in the beginning of this and if we do it jointly, we can get much further. But yeah, so that's it actually from my side. It's, um, yeah. Thank you very much, side. Christina. You're uh, welcome. Um, I congratulate you on another creative acronym for a project. And yeah. <laughs> got yes, gold star so. for, 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 for that particular idea. Um, what, what you highlighted, and I, from the policy learning platform perspective, I couldn't have done a better promotion for how a peer review can actually rapidly translate into something co concrete. Um, uh, I think you, you said it on your slide that, you know, two days working and then the, the experts leave you with a, a action plan or recommendations. And it's not like uh, it's a study visit and we had a nice time and we walk away. It's these are the things that you could do tomorrow. And you went from that to a pilot to now rolling out, uh, you know, a full scale um, program, which I think is is to be, uh, you know, congratulated because I think this, we've heard from the first two presentations the need to react quickly, that uh, the speed of action is important for your public authorities, your agencies, and your SMEs. So I think that's uh, to, well, to be, you know, congratulated. Um, one quick question from, from from me, and then we'll move to the, the joint panel. The different sort of um, um, programs for SMEs, um, I wondered whether, are you meeting the same or facing the same challenges uh, from SMEs, whether they're at the start or whether they're at the uh, more mature and advanced, or are there some common challenges that all SMEs are saying that this is really a, uh, you know, either a game changer for us or something we can't do alone? Are there any messages you're getting from the from SMEs? Um, yeah, often they are not aware of the, of the, how much this, like what it actually means to include artificial intelligence in mm. their, in their, um, company. So mm. often, uh, when working with the experts in the AI knowledge, uh, program, <clears throat> they, they came up with things that they haven't even thought about before. Mm. So what we learn is that, um, there's so much still to learn also for us, but also for the companies on how wide the range, like how big it is, how big it can be, how mm. much it can, um, artificial intelligence can be used in what ways um, that they haven't even, in, in ways that they haven't even thought of before. Mm. Mm. I think uh, so we saw that from Margaret's slide, the different thematic areas and behind each one, there's a new, almost a new business model uh, for, for, for some. In, in terms of measuring the success of um, how they spend their money. We know it's important for monitoring and evaluation. Are there any key performance indicators that you're using to say, okay, we've given you 15,000, we've given you 80,000. Are, are there any you know, KPIs that you're looking to monitor in particular? Um, well, they have to apply 
depending mm. on the uh, like the big one, the big one for 150,000 euro. Mm. Um, this one is not so easy to get. So there's a jury who will decide then um, which mm. project to support. Um, and then they have they do have to um, support us with um, a, like they get some up pre financing and then they have to send us some mid uh, term review like whatever happens and then they get the mid payment and then the final mm. one as well so they have to prove what they've done what they've learned um, to show us their results mm. um, on the smaller ones that is that is just 15,000 um, or that there is like it's much easier it's not so complicated okay maybe you can put a link into the chat later about where people can maybe get some more information yeah, sure. about the different programs sure. that would be good and then uh, just a quick question from uh, from the chat. Marina uh, says, uh, does your project, the, the, the one you've submitted, you know, Embrace yeah. ME, uh, of course, a pop-up window just blocks it when I'm trying to read it. <laughs> uh, does oh. it refer to uh, your uh, ability to, to align regional and national policies with the EU, uh, i.e. the AI Act? Uh, are you looking to look address that issue on how your regional and national yes, policy? Yes, definitely. Makers? That's mm -hmm. why I why I mentioned the I the AI Act, uh, okay. and because that's something that every nation and well, possibly also regions have to implement. Right. Um, so we want to, and generally the the issue of trustworthy artificial <laughs> intelligence is comes comes from the eu that's how the eu wants to separate from uh the us or the china that companies that are based in europe are uh, that are using our artificial intelligence are using it in a trustworthy way which is their usp so th this is definitely uh, in, in alignment with EU on your policies. agenda okay well thank you for that and um if, if i can just um give you an applause to all three speakers now and uh i'll ask you to join uh, you switch your cameras on, Margaret Guida, and we'll have a, a short a session, uh, pick up some questions that were put into the chat. So now's your chance to ask uh, some more. Um, I'll, I'll deal with the ones that I saw first. Uh, I think uh, Clive asked a question, which I think would be relevant. You could all three have a go at answering this. Is looking at how we can improve the education and training of, uh, of elected uh, uh, persons at national, regional, but I guess we're dealing with regional and local level. Uh, how can we tackle the education training needs so they are uh, fully um, made aware of what artificial intelligence can, can, can deliver? Um, maybe, Gida, you, you first, in terms of the Committee of Regions, you. Uh, you looked at this issue, I'm sure, and being an elected member, you're probably more uh, targeted uh, by, by this need. Yes, uh, of course, it's a good question because uh, eventually uh, we're not the experts uh, as an uh, elected uh, politician. Um, there are some experts, but I think uh, we have to create an, a need of emergency and, and, and uh, there's a lack of uh, sense of emergency. And um, sometimes uh, uh, something happens before we act. And uh, I think the AI Act uh, needs to be implemented in our brains. We have to uh, create uh, uh, the awareness of the opportunities, but also the trustworthy of the application. So uh, how we can do it is uh, invite us and, and tell us uh, the opportunities, but also uh, name the risks and, and uh, how you uh, want to deal with it. So please, uh, we're all in this together. Uh, as uh, Mrs. Koch stated, uh, in the US, uh, the market is in, in charge. In China, for example, the, 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 the state is in charge. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, we want the uh, human, to, uh, the, the inhabitants mm -hmm. to be in charge. So mm -hmm. invite us and tell us uh, the opportunities and uh, yeah, possible risks uh, and uh, yeah, platforms like this are uh, really good. But I hope mm. there are some politicians also, but not only policy makers or advisors, mm. but also politicians. Uh, so mm. uh, we have to address it to them. Yeah, I think you're right. Exposing all the different uh, stakeholders, we, we sometimes uh, assume uh, that it's just the policymaker, um, not, not just the one writing it, but the one who's voting. Uh, as well it needs to be engaged um, margaret you 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 mentioned the sort of triple helix uh you know dimension uh to what extent are your um 
meetings uh, engaging with elected uh, personnel or and are any of your good practice visits highlighting any interesting training or education programs for that group of, uh, of stakeholders? Well, first of all, I, I want to agree with you, Guido, that that's a very important group because uh, if elected representatives don't aren't aware of the great potential of AI as well as the immediate risks, then they aren't going to support AI initiatives within public service. So that question came from Clive. I think if it's my Clive from Enabler, thank you, Clive. I think it was and, uh, Clive, your Clive, because it's from the new. It? Okay. It was. <laughs> it was. So uh, Clive has been involving um, some elected representatives who joined, one of them, or two of them joined our, um, our kickoff meeting in Ireland. So uh, I haven't seen any courses. I've seen plenty, but in Ireland we have courses that are emerging for public service um, staff, but I haven't seen anything yet that's specifically designed for elected representatives. And I guess that that would be a, an excellent um, topic to just make elected representatives, yes, aware of the dangers and how um, AI, fake news and mm. uh, generative AI can uh, hoodwink people, but also about the very strong case for AI for societal good. So, um, yeah, good question. And I think we can do, we could do more. Mm. Uh, to involve elected representatives. Mm -hmm. okay. Christina, from, from your perspective, and uh, sometimes when we do a peer review, um, on the last day when the re recommendations are presented, uh, elected uh, members of the local regional authority attend. We've had ministers, we, we, with Laura, we would say we were in Potsdam, we had the Secretary of State who came to listen. So sometimes they are uh, engaged as, as Margaret said they, they joined some of the missions did you have any uh, elected uh, representatives engaged either in your pilot and or, or follow-up actions yeah my organization is um, owned by the ministry of economics and it used to be and digitalization now it has a different name but anyway mm -hmm. it used to be where <clears throat> during the peer review it was the ministry of economics and digitalization and the ministry of innovation and climate we had represented so this they are the financiers uh, of our funding programs and uh, we had representatives of both of those uh, ministries attending the peer review on the yeah. final day um, we also had other representatives in Austria for different um, organizations um, that are dedicated to artificial intelligence. So we had really a very, like the who is who of Austrians uh, artificial intelligence um, organizations was there mm. on the second day to okay. make sure that they also hear about the recommendations. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's interesting. And uh, the advantage of being two thematic experts is that while I'm chatting with you. I've got my colleague, Laura, who's putting much more useful information on the chat and, and highlighting one of our key services, which are the, uh, the selection of good practices that are validated by the experts. And she's just found a good one for you on a, a certificate, a foundation certificate for, for public servants. So Clive, it's not your elected person, but I think elected people can also regard themselves as public servants. So uh, um, looking at the, uh, the database of good practices is, is, is a way uh, forward. Um, and that next issue I, came to my mind listening to all of you, uh, and we know that whenever we, you, know, you, you ever submit a, a project, to, whether it's to Horizon Europe, to Interreg, to anything else, we're often asked to look for the complementarities and, and synergies, and, and I think at the Committee of Regions, your job is often to have uh, the wide perspective of the different challenges that are faced, uh, faced by regions, and, and the sort of question I, I, was, I was thinking of is, when, when we've seen how um, we have a DG Connect that is a, a launched a couple of years ago, the European Digital Innovation Hubs, and uh, each region was encouraged to, to bid for them, some on a national level, but um, cyber, uh, high, high performance computing capacity, and artificial intelligence were the three uh, core messages that were um, you know, encouraged uh, to ensure that the European Digital Innovation Hub uh, was um, at least addressing them. So 
it's a question to the audience as well. Um, uh, you can answer in the chat. Do any of your regional EDIH have artificial intelligence as a key uh, driver? You know, others can say, no, mine was cyber, but it'd be nice to know which regions, because uh, there's a lot of benchmarking uh, to be done in that. And, and the question to all three of you again is, and again, I'll, I'll stay in the same order. Guido, in terms of your work at the Committee of Regions, the, you know, you work a lot with the regional funding. Uh, to what extent on your work on artificial intelligence did you look at the work done by DG Connect and the European Digital Innovation Hub uh, initiative? Uh, thank you. Uh, both uh, initiatives uh, like uh, DG Connect, uh, we talked a lot about it and uh, of course they uh, made uh, the white paper and uh, of artificial intelligence and uh, yeah, so we discussed a lot about it and uh, why they had some uh, things named in the report or in the white paper or in the uh, concept AI. <coughs> so we had a lot of discussions with them, uh, good conversations, uh, and uh, I think we agree on a lot of uh, things, uh, mm -hmm. and especially on when it's human-centered uh, about uh, um, uh, social scoring, for example, or biometric mm -hmm. identification. Uh, mm -hmm. There are topics that we uh, agree on. Uh, they, um, especially a social scoring, we have to prevent that. And uh, so, um, yeah, I think both uh, initiatives are very important to bring us further in this uh, process. And uh, we discuss uh, with them and uh, I get some information from, uh, from them. And then I got some uh, inf uh, information from uh, other members of the committee and we put them together and uh, eventually they, uh, yeah, uh, embrace the report and uh, our uh, yeah report on the AI Act. So yeah. that's uh, really yeah. important. Uh, I, I was I, and thanks to those who are putting into the chat. It would be good uh, uh, for us to follow up and connect some of you together on your EDH. I, I know in in the call there were um, the three main topics I've just mentioned, but there was also a block uh, that of let's say focus you could have delivered on public administration. I more broadly looking at the digital dimension. And I think that was less well represented in, in the project. So I think there is still some work to be done uh, through these uh, instruments to make sure the public administration is addressed as a target and not just helping the SMEs, uh, you know, access, uh, you know, high performance computing uh, centers or AI, et cetera, et cetera. So public administration with, let's say, uh, the missing or the one that could be enhanced um, Margaret, do, what's happening in uh, around Donegal? Are you uh, in an uh, EDIH? Yes, we are, and uh, it's a very, very relevant instrument. Um, so our EDIH is called Data to Sustain. Earnact mm -hmm. is uh, part of the consortium, and our focus within that EDIH is interfacing to public organisations. Mm -hmm. So while Data to Sustain is focused on a range of digital technologies, AI is uh, an important one. So um, there's nine local authorities in the Northwest region of Ireland. So we're, we're beginning to have conversations with them and trying to identify common priorities mm. where they could, um, where they have skills gaps. That's another great area where the EDIH can be very mm. useful mm. or for eventually um, once they've, worked through a process, you have to do a digital maturity assessment and uh, give some considerations to the most um, mm. feasible and uh, valuable kind of piloting, but that can also be actually developed under the auspices of the EDIH. Mm. So I would encourage everybody that's listening, that's interested um, about skills development capacity within their organization to check out their their regional EDIH because they're all over Europe. Mm, indeed, and, and there's meant to be some networking and, and thematic working groups mm. set up. And I think yeah. uh, um, I think Lotta or Laura, you can put on in the chat the link to the work we did on the EDIH. Uh, we we had um, people from DG Connect join us in a in a in a similar event. Uh, again, trying to create these synergies between region development. Uh, and not just SME development. Um, Christina, did as the uh, you're more at the national level, but has the EDIH uh, featured in any of your discussions in the way the because uh, your SME focus, I would have imagined it's quite relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Like my organization 
is also part of one of the 80, we mm. call it 80s in German. Yeah. Um, in Austria, we have four in Austria, mm. so not so many, but uh, they are all, we are all working together anyway. And also what we plan to do is if the project would get approved, um, embrace me, we would also like to include the 80s, the EDH, <laughs> um, those that are working in the field of artificial intelligence and mm. quite many of them are do um, to include them also for or give them the opportunity to participate in the co-creation workshops mm. that might be relevant for them. Okay. Well, that, that, that's an interesting one to actually connect uh, uh, your ecosystems um, across the sort of different regions that are, are, are joining us today. Um, if I was an elected uh, person and Luckily for you, I'm not, so it's just quite, I can ask this question neutrally, um, but I, I see this AI and digital uh, you know, trend uh, around me and uh, competing demands for, for resources. Um, you know, we know the public sector finances are, are not always uh, able to meet all the conflicting demands. Uh, and if I just, I can remind you all of Margaret's slide, when she said, look, you know, there's things here in the environment, things here in, in citizens, things, things for local roads and mobility. Uh, and, and Guido, you showed us the different uh, dimensions of, uh, you know, major corporations driving their business models through, through AI. If you're, um, uh, you know, in a municipality or a region, you have some thematic areas that are your responsibility and others that are national level. But... If you are you know, looking at the, the priorities, whether they're sectoral or thematic, um, and if you had to choose three that were the, the first priorities where you could deploy artificial intelligence with uh, tools or services with most benefit for your local citizens, uh, where would you start? You know, you're, you're in the hot seat of the elected uh, representative, so it's right that you should have first go. Yeah, of course, um, it, is, uh, it benefits uh, when um, processes internal in the public administration are mm -hmm. going better, uh, efficiency. Uh, see, uh, so therefore, uh, in the public administration, some routine uh, um, processes can be uh, replaced by AI so that we can help our inhabitants uh, better than we do now and uh, faster. <laughs> Uh, chatbots, for example, is a really good uh, uh, opportunity because then they get the question, uh, the uh, answer on their questions earlier than they have when they have to wait for uh, uh, someone at uh, the phone. So chatbots is for me and uh, I think a lot of uh, uh, local aut uh, authorities, it's really uh, going to be a benefit uh, and, and therefore you have to invest but also have to uh, take care of uh, the uh, GDPR and that's uh, really difficult because chatbots and GDPR and who's uh, in charge uh, of the data, who's the owner of the data will, will st uh, still be the owner of the data. So that's really difficult with chatbots when it comes into depth uh, uh, about the uh, inhabitant. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. there's a possibility with AI, mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, traffic management, uh, when we have to uh, build a new road, for example, uh, and we have some data uh, uh, put up uh, with uh, how many cars in the road and uh, how should uh, uh, this uh, a twin, uh, a digital twin. Uh, and from that on, it's really uh, good to invest in that. And uh, yeah, our region uh, of the municipality of Emmen is uh, well known for circularity. And I think when you look at um, the Green Deal, for example, it's all mm. about uh, circularity and, and, and uh, zero emission. And mm. we also know that it's always together with digitalization. So I think uh, uh, with AI, uh, we can, uh, for example, you have PET, like the, flesh, uh, the, the bottles of Coca-Cola, it's all uh, plastics, and you can uh, mm. decide to how put some uh, plastics in and, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to uh, describe it in English, mm. uh, but uh, the di diverse uh, f uh, pet uh, f uh, bottles, we, we can split them. That's the mm. word. But, uh, this, so uh, chatbots, um, uh, I think for me, uh, the, the simulations, so the twin, uh, the digital mm. twins, 
and then of course uh, when it comes to circularity and digitalization mm. uh, yeah i think the twin transition is for us as a local community uh, very mm. important mm. in another project we're aware of um, uh, national cluster organizations that are working on the uh, uh, way in which industry can face this digital transition and the the uh, dimension as you mentioned are particularly relevant so there are some actors that can facilitate different paths but yeah, I think from a, um, a, the citizen slash elected uh, dimension, you've also got your own platform that you've been elected. If you're a region that's driving more public uh, transport, then mobility is a is a direct link, and you've highlighted that. Yeah, also, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Margaret. In, in terms of the, you know, putting on your local uh, regional hat now rather than your enabler. Uh, hat on and um, you know to to what extent do you see any prioritization or thematic priorities being uh, driven locally um well i think from uh, conversations with our local council areas that i um cons things like using the knowledge that's archived within the local authority mm -hmm. there's a lot of information in there which if um used with artificial intelligence you could give a much better advisory services to the citizen say for something like planning that's one area i've heard about mm -hmm. i think it's a challenging um time for regions all over europe with flooding so uh, i guess a common um, area where i could, could be used in a predictive way would be precisely that for the environment mm -hmm. uh, also in the environment area from what i understand with with other local authorities, um, there's increasingly uh, heavy burdens on local authorities <coughs> for environmental reporting. And I think uh, AI can be very useful there to help them um, reduce their workloads and still meet the requirements that are being placed on them. Mm -hmm. And overall, chatbots I've got to agree with totally because mm -hmm. that will free up public servants to be doing mm -hmm. higher quality, better value work. And the example we have from Derry um, is a very good one because uh, it's uh, set up to be able to nudge people, uh, advise them on how to recycle more and even tell them when uh, the recycling lorry is going to come around to their streets. Mm -hmm. So it's very well thought through. Mm -hmm. Better decision making. I mean, that's harder because often that requires data silos to be kind of opened up, maybe even between different entities. But better decision, we, all local authorities, I guess, have the same problem of limited resources. So making them used more effectively, uh, repairing the correct roads that are in the most urgent or whatever, it's a kind of generic um, area for improved public mm. service. Mm. Okay, well, thanks for those insights from, um, from, from a, a, let's say a citizen user, a perspective when I get a chat bot and at the end it said were you happy with the answer and I say no and then there's I need to have a human and that's what Gida you said in your intervention here is there's, there has to be at least some place going back to the human and uh, um, we've all been to our supermarkets where now you have tills where you go and scan your own products I mean yeah. the interesting data the sort of industry thought they were going to be massive redundancies but they've actually found that humans can now wander around the shop and help customers make more informed choice the, yeah. the scanning is actually slower because you know it doesn't scan first time and then then you need staff there so the fear of technology creating job losses is actually um, not materialized in, in this sort of a fast moving consumer goods but it's interesting to have a, a chat bot or you know an automatic machine but you still need the um default uh, smiling okay. human mm. and also you need to know that you're talking to a chatbot and not a human yeah mm -hmm. okay i think uh, ai will uh, keep uh, uh, humans working because mm. there are some jobs we can't find any people anymore in, in mm. the Netherlands, we have a lack of uh, uh, employees yeah. so yeah. we have to create uh, ai mm. uh, because mm. of keeping those uh, organizations and companies running mm. Mm. So, I have another good example I just remembered from uh, Slovenia, where um, the university there created a chatbot which can sign, do sign language. 
So convert immediately yeah. text into a signed uh, communication with a citizen. So again, that's another really good use case of how you can capture the potential of AI yeah. to give yeah. better service to the public. Okay. The of the questions of uh, the citizens will be the same. So that part you can uh, automatize uh, and the 20% uh, uh, of uh, the people who uh, get the question, are you satisfied by the answer? And mm. the answer is no. 20% we can help with the uh, human. Uh, human. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, I hope I'm not uh, the only painful person with a chatbot. But, um, uh, Christina, do, in your perspective, have you seen any thematic uh, priorities emerging uh, in the in discussions around your, your particular domain? Um, well, I agree with the ones that were mentioned already okay. um, by the other two. And uh, one area I think that is going to be very big and that is already very big is also the health area. Mm -hmm. uh, and there it is even more important that uh, the artificial intelligence used is trustworthy mm -hmm. and that we will not become a uh, second China or or similar in that mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, no, I think with health, we've seen in just the in the in the domain of cancer scanning images and the yes. you know, the ability for machinery now to be more accurate in its diagnosis and therefore uh, either more rapid intervention or uh, avoiding intervention. I think that's a, you know a huge area. It's less in the domain of the public policy makers that we we work with. It tends to be a, a national domain, but I think it it is a huge area. Last question, and then uh, this is a very brief one, I think. And uh, Marina put something on the chat about uh, the interoperability, uh, uh, and uh, she mentioned the cross-border dimension. So I, I, we can't finish this discussion without uh, you highlighting a, a good cross-border example where AI could help. Um, uh, you know, Gita, your city's in a cross-border, the Dutch-German uh, area. Margaret, you're based in Northwest Ireland. You've got a, a Brexit-friendly border to... To, de to, to deal with somewhere around there. Christina, you're surrounded by uh, the rest of Europe. Uh, one example each of a, of, a, of a good way AI could help interregional or, or, or cross-border cooperation. I have one, but it's not a, a very popular one. But I think uh, when we are uh, talking about uh, traffic limits or speed tickets, uh, I think mm. uh, when we uh, cooperate and collaborate uh, on that one, and mm. we have the same language, uh, and then I think, uh, yeah, we can mm. make it more safe uh, on the road. Mm. Okay, That's one you won't get many votes for that one. But never mind. <laughs> Mar Margaret. I guess yeah. um, for the environment, I mean, rivers don't respect borders, mm. so um, air quality as well. You know, mm. those kind of things mm. um, are all kind of. Mm. Um, without borders yeah. and uh, AI has a, a key role. Mm. So for tra transport, it's a major polluter. So cooperation on the levels of transport and using AI mm. um, for the for decision-making on a cross-border basis, we have a massive amount of traffic across uh, our regional border. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the, we, we attended the European Week in Regions and Cities and we uh, interreg Europe uh, participated in a session with DG uh, Digit uh, on interoperability. Uh, so we're, we're certainly looking at that area to engage more on the interregional uh, with the, the, the data driven and traffic, health, uh, the citizen services in cross border cities. You you know you know them better than I do. Uh, you know you don't want to have a bus timetable that you know one stops at 10 o'clock the other one starts at nine o'clock and you know simple things in, in, in life um christina you got a one good, good example of interregional ai accelerator and then i'm going to give the floor to laura who's gonna gonna help us wrap up um i'm not sure about maybe like crime i know that there's already they already uh, there's already interpol um, yeah, yeah interpol <laughs> i think they yeah. could they could also get yeah. Uh, I know of someone who works in the, in the Dutch uh, administration and they have to then translate all the papers to indeed get uh, the right crime documentation uh, to pick up someone from France or Belgium. So it is a clear domain. Well, um, just to pick up on Margaret's point of view, and again, uh, I think Marina Manzoni mentioned it, public procurement. We With, um, with Laura, we did a, a recent... Um, um, I think a webinar on public procurement and innovative public procurement. 
And there's a project that's funded by DG RTD uh, on, uh, called Protect. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, Margaret, you'll be interested maybe. It's, it's about inter-regional cooperation using data, whether it's from the space, whether it's from data uh, collected in cities or in rivers, and um, funding a PCP, which is about you know, driving the innovation research in SMEs forward through um, public procurement. So using the public money to actually ensure you know Europe stays at the forefront. So protect is 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 I think it's going to be a 19 million euro call that is now open to drive uh, you know climate adaptation, climate mitigation measures for funding SMEs. So, um, but public procurement has been a theme that we have dealt with, and um, someone kindly had mentioned it. And AI public procurement, I think, is Gida. You had it on one of your slides, funding. So, yeah, the two go in hand in hand. Well. Thank you both, uh, sorry, thank you all three of you. Uh, and uh, it's really fascinating listening to you. Uh, I think we're going to be following this up. There's an awful lot of material that you've started to, uh, to share with us. And I think uh, we will certainly be coming onto the ground, uh, trying to uh, engage more with the community on, on this issue. So Laura, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, dear speakers. Uh, it was a real learning process also from my side. Thank you, Mark, for your excellent moderation as always. And uh, um, I, I forgot to mention in my introduction that this is the first uh, one of a series of events dealing with digitization of uh, the public sector. We will publish uh, a policy brief very soon, and then we will most probably end uh, next year with a, a on-site workshop on, on digitization of the public sector and uh, a focus on of, Gov, of the GovTech sector. So please stay updated uh, on uh, on our on our Interreg Europe events. And then just to wrap up, uh, last and. Uh, I kindly ask you to answer our final poll. Uh, so we are still using the Slido. Thank you, Lottie. Uh, what's one key takeaway or lesson from today's webinar that you plan to apply in your work or daily life? Please just use uh, one, <clears throat> one word. Trust. Interoperable. Commitment, awareness, wisdom, optimistic, ideas, momentum, peer review, okay. <laughs> Please apply. <laughs> Awareness. Okay. Well, I think that uh, on this we can we can close our webinar. Thank yeah, you. I, I will just add yeah. one, one one point, Laura. I think you you were right to say that this is part of a, a family of events. Um, we highlighted you know peer reviews and we highlight workshops. But there's an even simpler way for which you can follow up with us. Um, it's simply called a help desk. If you've got any specific questions uh, that either come out from today's discussion or in general on interregional uh, cooperation and collaboration opportunity, you can ask us and we can then use the different uh, good practices. Uh, we can use the different knowledge we've got from the project and try and give you a sort of a quick checklist of what you can do. That can then lead to a matchmaking, it can lead to a, a workshop being organized in your region, it can lead to a, a webinar like today, or even a peer review. But the simplest thing is a help desk. Just ask us a simple question and we can give you, you know, some insights to the latest policy trends and documents. And I think that's uh, what Laura was saying, how this continuity, we have different services. So um, uh, we look forward to carrying on working with you and. Uh, uh, helping you get access to, to the key speakers as we've been uh, very privileged to have with us today. So. Dear Mr. Patterson, is it mm. a, a chatbot or is it just a help desk? It's a, it's a human behind it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we, we, should, we should maybe automate it. Uh, we'll, we'll check it. But uh, you put me out of a job here, Guido. <laughs> <laughs>
that's a very good, good time being it's still uh, it's still us mark yeah. uh mark and i and all other thematic experts from the policy learning platform mm. it's all about um, consideration yeah, yeah maybe we will consider it mm. <laughs> and, uh, thank you thanks to all the people who've been adding information to the uh the, the conversation we'll uh yeah, and um, please, uh, um, when 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 the webinar closes, there will be um, a survey that will pop up. So mm -hmm. do not hesitate to fill it in with your comments, suggestions, and and uh, whatever. It will be very very helpful for us for our future webinars and other events. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for joining. Thank George. you. I hope you joined our webinar, and uh, I hope to see you uh, in other in other occasions. Thank you, uh, thank you, dear speakers. Thank you very thank much you. for your thank you very much. contribution. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.